people say this courage, they say, they talk to me about my courage fairly frequently, and that's not right exactly. I, I just learned to be afraid of the right thing. And I really mean that. I mean, I saw an endless repetition in my clinical practice and in my own private life when my eyes were open, the consequences of not saying what was true. It's like whatever hell you might fall into by opening your mouth when you have something to say that isn't popular, it's nothing like the hell that you're going to envelop yourself in if you lose control of your own tongue and mind. And I, like I said, in my clinical practice, I never saw anyone get away with anything even once. And so all you have in a situation like that is what is the truth. Now, you know, of course, you only have your approximations to the truth, but that's better than nothing. And so you need to be afraid of the right thing, and you should be afraid of contaminating your soul with deceit. That's what you should be afraid of. That will definitely do you in, and I know exactly how. What happens is, you know, garbage in, garbage out, the old programmer saying goes, and so you'll fill your head with nonsense and no one will call you on it except you, but you can still that voice if you try hard enough. You just wait until you get in real trouble. You know, one day there'll come a point where you have to make a decision, and the decision is the difference between life and death, or worse, between someone else's life and death, or worse, between health and the suffering that's worse than death. And because you've compromised yourself to such a degree, you will not be able to rely on your judgment, and you will make the mistake you shouldn't make. And then you're done. And that will absolutely happen. So you tell mistruths voluntarily at your exceptional peril, and you avoid the unpleasant truths that you might have to delve into in all their messiness at your absolute peril and the peril of everyone around you. And so if you see that, you become afraid of that. That's hell, and hell is worse than death. So, and I mean that most sincerely. I heard recently from a reliable source that Putin's conversion to Orthodox Christianity might be genuine. And then you might think, well, if you're atheistic, well, that's not necessarily a good thing, or maybe you think it's a bad thing, or maybe you think it's an irrelevant issue, and you may also think it's a lie, but I would say that I would be more inclined to trust someone who thinks there's something higher than himself. And then you might say, well, what is it that's higher than ourselves? And that's worth thinking about. And we all need to think about this, regardless of the particulars of our religious belief. And I would say, again, from a clinical perspective, service to others is really something. People who are depressed tend to use the pronouns I and me much more frequently than people who aren't depressed. And I'm not saying that people get depressed because they're selfish. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that one of the way out, one of the routes out of depression appears to be an increase in service to other people. And I think the reason for that is because we aren't power mad demons at the core, even though we may be tempted by such things, and that we find the genuine meaning that offsets genuine suffering in the genuine service to others. And I think it's a big mistake to be cynical, especially prematurely, about such things as political activity because they're necessary despite, let's say, their adversarial and, uh, and uh, party-centered nature, partisan nature. You have to be clear about what you serve and why. And that has to be held higher always than mere victory, mere operationalized victory or instrumental victory. It's a very, very difficult thing to, to negotiate, particularly because in the political realm, in some sense, you have to defeat your enemy, right? Because you have to win the election and the other people have to lose. It's a binary choice. But so often I see in partisan discussion, the proclivity to assume that all the ill will and malevolence resides on the other side of the chamber. And that's a big mistake. And you can think about that more deeply too, is that we all have to put, we all need a place to place the existence of malevolence, right? Because malevolence clearly exists and we're all suffer from the weight of malevolent history, right? Because even the grounds we walk on here, which this is a remarkable and wonderful place, 
I mean, English soil is soaked with blood, just like the soil of every place in the world. That's part of the human heritage, and all of us bear the marks of that conflict in some sense in our souls, partly because of the possibility for us to engage in that, but also partly because part of the reason we're here in all this privilege is because of all that catastrophe. Well, the best way to localize that malevolence is inside you. Right, and to remember that the enemy that you're fighting with, the greatest enemy that you ever fight with, is in your own heart. And that will also stop you from confusing that true source of malevolence, let's say, with your mere political enemies. And that isn't to say that you won't encounter malevolent behavior, although most of it in the political sphere, as it is everywhere, most of it is more ignorance than malevolence, although willful blindness certainly plays a large role. And so you need to know what it is that you're serving. And I would say one of the ways to do that practically, or a couple of ways to do that practically, is you need a good team around you, the people you really trust, and who can watch you, and who do it with a certain degree of impartiality, and who are disagreeable enough to talk to you when you do something wrong. So you need trusted advisors. There's no shortage of victimhood. I mean, you know, the existential psychotherapists in the 50s taking a page from Heidegger talked about thrownness, right? The arbitrary nature of our existence. I mean, here you are, you, you have the ethnicity and race that was bestowed upon you. You had no choice in that. You're the victim and the beneficiary of this particular historical moment. You know, you and you're the victim and beneficiary of all the atrocity and the wonders of the past. You deal with your own emotions. You deal with the, the fact of this specific time and place, all of that. And there is a sense of well, there's a sense of mortality, certainly, that's associated with that with finitude and mortality. And you can easily say, in some sense, that we're all victimized deeply by our own susceptibility to vulnerability and tragedy. And I think that's true. But, but then the question is, well, what's the best way of dealing with that? And falling prey to it, when my daughter was young, she was very ill. And one of the things we told her repeatedly, and which I think she did very well to her credit, was often she was too ill really to be able to go to school because she couldn't wake up in the morning and she was in pain. And, but she needed to go to school. And well, one of the things we told her was, don't use your illness as an excuse, right? Because you're already in trouble, kid. You know, you got your problems and it, they're serious. But if you can hold on to the distinction between the part of you that can in spite of this and the part that can't because of it and not blur that distinction, then that's one more thing you have on your side while you're attempting to struggle through this. And to her credit, she managed that and quite pristinely and that was extraordinarily helpful. It was very difficult at times uh, after she had had her hip replaced, she, she couldn't get around that well. And so we decided to put her in a motorcycle course, which was a rather terrifying thing to do since she just had a hip replacement, but she needed to have a scooter to get around. And so she went with her mother to this motorcycle uh, course and they were driving motorcycles, not scooters. And at one point, one of the people who was being trained wiped out on the motorcycle and, you know, it was rather traumatic, let's say. And, uh, she woke up the next day and was too afraid to go to the course. And so we said, well, you know, it's understandable. Why don't you just get in the car and go to the course and see when you get there if you can manage it? And she got herself out of bed and went and managed it. And then she passed the course. And then she had a scooter and could zoom around the city for the next couple of years. And so that was really good. But it was, it was very hard to draw that line, right? Because in some sense, she'd been victimized by this arbitrary illness. And, you know, you, you tend as a parent to have an outpouring of empathy, the empathy that can destroy under those circumstances because you, you coddle the person more than is absolutely necessary, right? And you have every reason to because they're suffering like mad. But you want to be a victim and be a tragic figure? You know, and you might say yes, but you wouldn't if you thought it through. So... And then if someone asked me that question, say, in a clinical setting, I would do a little analysis of it. It's like, okay, well, you're suffering from this traumatic experience. You want to get over it. We'd have to figure out what the practical steps might be, and that might be finding somebody to talk to, or there's other ways of dealing with it. But you delve into the practical realm to sort of address that.